All right, so why don't we get started? Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar. This webinar is focused on business survival during and beyond COVID-19. Uh, thank you all for joining us and spending yet another hour of your day on Zoom with us. Uh, my name is Eric Benamou. I am the founder and a general partner at uh, Benamou Global Ventures, BGV in short. We're a Silicon Valley based VC firm headquartered in Palo Alto with offices in uh, Tel Aviv, Paris and Bangalore. And I'm joined here on this panel by Susie Duran, a partner at Singly Wack, and by Anthony Zanontian, entrepreneur and uh, co-founder of Anthony's Goods. I'm going to ask them both to introduce themselves more fully in a minute. Uh, but first, let me notify you all that uh, the Zoom session is being recorded. Uh, and I will start it right now. Uh, I also want to remind you that uh, we have a Q&A session of about uh, 15 to 20 minutes uh, at the end, but we encourage you to write your questions throughout the discussions through Zoom. You click the Zoom uh, uh, Q&A button at the, but at the bottom of your screen, and we'll take them up in turn at the end and answer as many questions as we can. So let me begin by asking Anthony to give us a little bit more of an introduction and a, and a background on the, what he's been doing and what he's doing right now. Anthony. Sure. Um, thanks, Eric. Um, I'm the co-founder of a company called Anthony's Goods. Um, we're a U.S. Uh, food manufacturer based out of Los Angeles. And we started the company about seven years ago um, as a really small time, uh, better for you brand. And the brand um, sort of started snowballing year after year, and we ended up becoming the largest um, marketplace food manufacturer on the Amazon platform. And about six-ish months ago, we were acquired by ABF Foods, which is the um, pretty much like the craft of the UK. Um, and so that transaction was completed in September, um, and I continue to co-CEO <laughs> the company. Um, and, um, and yeah, that's a quick story about Anthony's Goods. That's great. Uh, thanks, Anthony. And let me ask Susie to introduce herself and, uh, and her firm. Great. So my name is Susie Duran, and I'm a partner in the audit group at Singer Leewek. We're about 400 people. We have 10 offices in California. We also have an office in uh, Colorado. And uh, I've had the fortune of being able to get to know Eric as a client, as well as uh, getting to know Anthony. So we're really excited to uh, kind of start this webinar and share with you some of their insights. That's great. Thank you both. Uh, let me say emphatically that despite the deluge of pundit recommendations about what you should do, what you should not do to weather the crisis, one size does not fit all. Every one of your businesses has one optimal way to survive this shock and to thrive afterwards. And no, it's not just a matter of cutting costs and ruthlessly asking the SBA for bailout money. This may very well be part of what you need to do, but not necessarily only that. So I can tell you that at BGV, one of the first things we did a few weeks ago at the onset of the COVID-19 crisis was to triage our portfolio in a very granular way and out of this exercise, uh, we identified three broad buckets of cases that began to emerge. Uh, the first one you might call the tailwind group. They're, they're the luckiest. If you happen to be a manufacturer of um, hand sanitizers, for example, this is your time to rise. More generally, any business whose products or services contribute directly to the WFH work from home lifestyle, has seen a dramatic acceleration in their business. Think about the very company we're using to conduct this webinar, Zoom. Think about companies focused on e-commerce, and I think Anthony will tell us more about this in, in a minute. So while it's, it's still somewhat speculative, the habits that we're adopting right now and the products and services we're consuming in the process may continue way past the time that COVID-19 threat has subsided. The second bucket faces headwinds. 
but not so strong as to fundamentally jeopardize the reason to exist or the business model. Uh, these companies have to hunker down, reduce costs, get as much government help as they can qualify for, and weather the storm to get to the other side. However, even then may need to be more creative than just preserve cash, and more on this a bit later. The third bucket uh, may face more than just headwinds. They got thrusted into the eye of a storm that fundamentally threatens their existence and the business model. How would you like to run a restaurant chain or a cruise line or a movie theater, for example? This group faces stark choices and must consider a serious pivot in their strategy and the business model and their brand and a lot of other choices. So let's explore these three broad types of situations in turn. And I think Anthony is, is probably a great spokesperson for a business that can benefit from tailwinds. Uh, and I think it'd be good to understand what, what you've seen happen to your business, Anthony, and what you recommend be generalized to other companies that fall in this category. Anthony. Yeah, sure. Yeah, happy, happy to, to kick it off. Um, so we're, I think, one of the uh, work from home beneficiaries of, of COVID. Um, we've seen a considerable uptick um, in sales um, due to uh, you know this pandemic that's going on. Um, our uh, sort of main you know um, way to market has always been online. So we've avoided um, quite consciously brick and mortar. Um, whether that's me just saying it because we're not in many brick and mortars, or <laughs> or the fact that we've actually probably consciously avoided it, um, has sort of put us in the right place um, to sort of be a beneficiary of, of this of this issue. Um, every every sort of time we had gone to a brick and mortar um, uh, buyer or, or customer, um, it ended up costing the company uh, tens of thousands of dollars. And very early on, we were always such a small team, we made the conscious choice to completely avoid that cost and instead invest in more and more products. So um, the product portfolio continued to grow quite significantly um, while we just, you know, very much so avoided the brick and mortar route and very much so heavily concentrated on e -com. So because of that, um, we were sort of in the right place at the right time when, when this issue happened. And we've seen, like I mentioned before, a, a pretty considerable uptick. Um, we're, we're hiring uh, multiple shifts now um, at our production facility in California. Um, we've laid off none of our staff um, are continuing to hire in, in that regard. So uh, we've been quite lucky um, in, in that sense. Um, and I think that the, uh, the biggest sort of byproduct of this is um, sort of what you were speaking to, Eric, is, um, you know, taking advantage of those tailwinds, but also being quite cautious in the moves you're making. Um, we're very aware that, you know, this might be an initial rush on items that we sell. And I think similar sort of companies that are benefiting from this, um, you know, maybe consumers are, are hoarding or stockpiling and you can get into a trap very quickly if you're manufacturing this, like a, an item that has a, a shelf life where you might be overbuying, uh, you might be misinterpreting the market. Um, and it's a very difficult decision to make of, you know, how much inventory you should be investing in as, as a business that manufactures. Um, so this is a very, very tough decision we spend a lot of time on uh, internally. Um, and so, so yeah, it's, it's actually, it's, it's, I don't think I've ever lived anything through this. I'm, I think I'm on the younger side of people, but I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime in terms of just um, trying to deal with uh, in, intense consumerism, <laughs> if we can call it that. Um, so um, some of the other things that we've sort of noticed um, that we've, we've tried to avoid completely is, is any sort of price increases. I think that um, another sort of pitfall that companies might fall into is short-term profits uh, in a scenario like this, where as you sort of are going to come out of um, this scenario, you want to make sure that you're, you know, you've, you've built and sort of uh, continue to hold the trust of the customers that you've had for such a long time. You don't, you don't want to, you know, shortchange them for just, you know, minor profits in, in, in a very short amount of time. Um, we've, we've pretty much frozen all price increases across the board if we can. Um, and I also think that from a purchasing standpoint as well. So supply chain has become um, somewhat of an issue, but we're still doing okay um, internally. Um, but we've had uh, suppliers that have tried to increase prices just dramatically on us. And that's been so negative internally that we've, we've made the conscious choice to, 
to stop buying from them um, once once this um, pandemic passes. So it's it's not only from you know, you know B two C, but from a B two B basis, um, you have to think about how you're going to come out of this thing versus just you know how to get through it and, and you know how, how you can um, maximize profits during during this time. I think that's an uh, inaccurate approach. So Anthony, uh, you've had to really draw from your spike capacity to increase volume. You mentioned that uh, you hired multiple ships. Yep. Um, what about your your infrastructure of uh, your technology infrastructure, your e-commerce infrastructure? Yeah, How we've always cope with a surge in, in traffic and volume. Yeah, so we've always been since we've been so e-com focused. Um, it sort of you know the uptick we've seen hasn't really affected us uh, in scaling on those um, parts of our business. Um, everything that we do is pretty much. Um, um, fulfilled by Amazon. That's, that's probably the largest portion of our business. So, you know, with their scale, you know, we, we've sort of been untouched. I mean, again, there have been very unlucky, unlucky categories with Amazon. They released a statement about a week and a half ago, I think, where they excluded certain um, manufacturers and sellers from sending an inventory that weren't part of these critical categories. So again, you know, it's kismet. Like we're, we just happen to be a food manufacturer. Um, people happen to be buying food. Um, and so because of that, We've been able to scale up without any issue in terms of fulfillment and delivery. Um, on the technology side, everything that we've built is internal, um, so uh, we have a really strong team. So we're not relying on any external tools, um, and everything scales up uh, really nicely. And have you suffered from any disruption in your supply chain? Because for yeah. a while, when when China was basically out of business and could not speak to us, uh, certainly not not ship us goods. Uh, many many supply chains were disrupted, and then we rediscovered the fact that uh, regional supply chain are absolutely critical to a resilient business. Yeah, absolutely. We've started. Um, we sort of anticipated um, that actually a little while ago when the Trump tariffs went into play. So um, that automatically caused us to start looking elsewhere in the world. Um, there are certain products that are you know, China only that you can't get in other parts uh, of the world that we that we use. Um, mainly ingredients that come from China, but um, yeah, otherwise we've we've definitely branched out and looked at other places to to manufacture the certain things in our supply chain that we don't want to be completely relied on for one country. Um, but having said that, we we have such good lead times internally. Um, we've we've sort of built our systems to um, you know give us a very nice buffer uh, in case there are issues like this because we've dealt with countries like India where you know um, 30, 60 day lead times or issues are, are not uncommon. So, um, so that hasn't really affected us in, in that sense. Um, India shutting down <laughs> their port about a week and a half ago uh, definitely made us raise our eyebrows. Uh, but I think that everything we needed was on the water. And we've been given guidance that um, I think by April 22nd, they expect to reopen. But again, that's just guidance. But I think the, the scenario is that, you know, if we're sort of, um, you know, in a bind for ingredients that are you know, made and coming from India that you can't source anywhere else. I think the rest of the world's in a bind as well. So um, luckily for us, we, we have pretty nice buffers, I think in the six-ish six month range um, from India. So um, we don't expect any sort of supply chain issues there. So Anthony, you were in, the, in a good good position of being a pure e-tailer, uh, but the majority of retailers in the US have only modest size e-tail business. They still remain fundamentally brick and mortars, at least more than half of the business. I'm thinking about companies like Macy's and Kohl's and Neiman Marcus and Nordstrom and the, 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 the major retailing brands. Uh, how do you think their business uh, will be affected by this crisis? And uh, when we're on the other side of it, uh, how quickly do you think people will feel comfortable going back to shopping malls and how much of their retail habits uh, will remain? Yeah, I think um, my, my business partner and I have always had the really strong sense that um, it's going to change eventually. You know, I think um, buying has always, I think I can speak pretty specifically to grocery. I'm not sure what, you know, um, overall retail is in terms of, you know, Macy's or clothing, but in the grocery world, 5% of groceries are bought online. It's hugely uncomfortable for people to buy groceries online. Um, I don't know what the exact statistic is now, you know, because of COVID, but I would, you know, just based on our numbers, I'd imagine that's, you know, either doubled or tripled or something along those lines where people are now much more comfortable buying online and now are making the conscious choice of shifting their purchasing power to the internet versus a store because they don't want to walk in, they don't want to be you know, potentially exposed to this virus. Um, but 
you know, past that, we've always had sort of the thought and, and thought process internally that, you know, one buyer at a brick and mortar store shouldn't control what people have access to. That That's always seemed insane to us, you know, where in, in the world of the internet, when your catalog is unlimited, why should what the consumer gets only be limited to shelf space? That's, it's, you know, it's, it's always been this idea that we've always talked about internally and just, we've always, you know, you know, had a drink and be like, this is the craziest thing. When is this going to change? Like that sort of internal, um, you know, discussion founders often have. Um, I think this is sort of put that on its head where I think, you know, people are realizing that the buyer is not all powerful. You know, you're, it's, it's not at their whim, whether or not a product w you know, wins or, or loses. Um, and so I think one, um, these traditional brick and mortar businesses and other businesses that are reliant on brick and mortar are going to have to drastically change. Um, when your store is not open and you're not selling goods, I mean, what's the value that you're bringing? You're not a sales channel anymore. Um, so I think that people are going to have to really make that shift and focus on e-com, um, whereas maybe it was a back burner idea because the brick and mortar business was so good for them, especially in grocery. I think a lot of grocers haven't even considered e-com. Um, but now I think local chains like Ralph's and Vaughn's here in California have started websites or doing um, curbside pickup. I think those are the two big items they're, they're sort of focused on, but I think that's going to pale in comparison to the value that Amazon or an Amazon style, um, you know, company can, can bring to the consumer. Um, there's no reason for you to go somewhere if it can be delivered to you, you know, it's, it's highly inefficient um, in that regard. But, um, but yeah, I think that's, there's, it's going to be the cause of a huge shift. Um, and I think that again, in grocery, this, the dollar, you know, has shifted again, away from um, not only just buying in brick and mortar, but I think people are cooking home a lot more um, because they don't want to go out to grocery stores. And that buying power has shifted from buying your, you know, staple foods and, and sort of meals, let's call it not groceries, but your meals um, externally at grocery stores, I mean, sorry, at, uh, at restaurants. And now you're purchasing those ingredients and making the food at home, um, which again is, you know, tailwinds in our, in our example. But um, we're again, very cautious whether or not we are, you know, highly investing in inventory um, because all of our stuff is, it expires. <laughs> it's, it's, okay. There's an expiry date on what we buy. So it's not like clothing, but I guess you could say the same thing for clothing because things go out of style. But I think ours is much, a much more hard, hard date where we have to throw it away after a while. But, yeah. That's but, also how you maintain your quality and your name. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's something we've always been, um, I think, you know, five, six-ish years ago, we made the conscious decision where we were cutting out all the middlemen. Um, so we actually go country to country. We fly out. Um, we purchase directly, we import it ourselves, and then we manufacture it ourselves, which sort of guarantees the freshest product and the longest shelf life. So um, everything we have is shelf stable. Um, I want to say uh, ranging from 12 months being the thing, the items that expire the soonest up to five years. Um, so we're, we're quite lucky in that regard as well. We're not like milk that expires in weeks. So if we make a bad call, we have a few months to sort of, you know, figure it out. So you're probably in the top five, top ten percent luckiest of all the business. I guess. I guess we're, we're really. Or I mean, it's it's been definitely an uphill battle for seven years, but I think the 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 luck is finally starting to turn turn around. Turn around. Good. So maybe let, let me turn to Susie now and uh, ask her to speak about uh, the vast majority of the of the other businesses and the other CEOs who are on, on this webinar. Who have to struggle with a significant downturn that was certainly nobody's plan when they started the year. So, so you tell us a little bit about uh, what you see happening, the, the typical measures that are being taken by businesses who see at least a, a solid quarter, perhaps two quarters of fundamental uh, drop in business. So I think it's uh, about being strategic and um, really kind of being careful about your decisions as Anthony was saying. So I'm actually working with two companies, I believe both entrepreneurs are actually on this webinar now um, and they're listening in. One of them is a company that actually uh, was making bug spray, organic bug spray. And so what they've done is they've shifted and uh, there is organic alcohol and you can make um, organic hand sanitizer as well as just regular hand sanitizers. And so they've shifted in that direction and shifted very quickly, kind of even before a company like a Tito's is coming in, who obviously they're an alcohol company. And so um, they are using that as kind of a springboard for them to continue to do their R&D and put other, um, not only other products like organic shampoos, but also basically really managing their supply chain, making sure that 
um, as kind of what Anthony alluded to, you know, they're having situations where people are saying, well, we want you to do a $5 million purchase commitment of alcohol. And by the way, we also want cash on delivery, right? So that puts them in a tough situation. So they really need to strategize about their supply chain and be smart about how they're using their cash and also how they're projecting uh, basically how they're going to use their cash in terms of their lead times, especially considering that there may be other market players that will enter into the market quickly. I have another company that is in the healthcare industry, and what they are doing is they're working with kind of your highest and most expensive uh, patients, and what they're doing with those patients is they're saying, okay, we have a home system where we go into your house, we look at your medications, we look at your subscriptions, and we basically are just basically helping you to manage your daily life so you're not going to the emergency room and costing the insurance companies a lot of money. And what they've been able to do is take those same existing customers instead of doing home visits, now they're doing virtual visits, which is great. So I think it's an opportunity for both of those companies to not just increase market share, but to pivot, to kind of manage their supply chain, to look at their customers and really give them real-time virtual um, aid. And that's actually really important to be able to make that shift. I think to Anthony's point earlier, it's really important that um, you can do both. You can do brick and mortar if that's what you need to do, but you also be able need to really be able to be nimble and be virtual. So now that we're all at home, uh, working at home, if you're a company that wasn't ready to be remote, this is a very, very expensive time. So hopefully you've invested in that infrastructure to do that. And technology becomes tantamount, right? Especially when we have security issues. Um, that's probably something where you can probably speak to more, Eric, because I know that's an area that you specialize in. But in terms of companies, I think right now you want to reforecast, right? You want to look at your cat, your historical uh, historical performance, especially in the last two quarters, uh, and maybe even in the last few weeks. And you want to basically project them forward based on some change assumptions, such as your base revenue model, and also being able to streamline expenses. Many companies are drawing down the result revolvers. Uh, and as, all, as we're all doing, we're watching the news. And the CARES Act has been really, really um, effective in getting all these businesses to ask to get different EIDL loans through the SBA or the uh, payroll protection program loans, uh, which are going through the banks. Uh, you guys probably know that the demand for those has been really, really high, as well as the fact that uh, many customers um, of the banks are actually drawing down all the re revolvers. So they're really, really conserving cash and they're looking opportunistically on what their next steps are in conjunction with looking at their forecasted cash projections, as well as being able to pivot very quickly to become a virtual leader in this marketplace. Susie, uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion the last few days on uh, the various components of the CARES Act. Uh, you mentioned EIDL, uh, PPP, and also some of the parameters. Um, how effective do you think this program will be in a sense of uh, how quickly will capital flow into these small businesses and these employees? Uh, should, should we expect uh, checks to, to, to to be cut in the next couple of weeks, or will it take two months for the whole machine to get into gear? The hope is immediately, but I think that the reality is that's not what we're seeing. I don't know anybody who's applied directly for the EIDL loans um, with the SBA who's gotten any cash. Uh, we have a lot of people who were basically waiting for the Bank of America portal to open at midnight so that they could apply for the PPP loans. Uh, I think there's a little bit of a disconnect between what the SBA is able to do and willing to do versus what the Treasury wants to do. I think a lot of these businesses, if we don't act quickly, especially those in the hospitality and the restaurant business, will um, suffer mightily. So we really have to move quickly. But I would say don't, and this is what I tell my clients, don't rely on it 100% as your only resource of being able to get cash. You have to have to think of alternatives and you have to think about other ways that you can basically uh, ensure that your business continues through the situation. Yeah. 
Um, but I'd actually like to ask both, um, especially you, Eric, I mean, because I know you're going to talk about the next topic, but what you guys think about that. Well, in general, I think that uh, as, as a whole, the CARES Act is extremely favorable. I mean, this is the, the biggest small business bailout in our living history. If it's administered and executed well, I think it can make a, a tremendous difference in how quickly we get out of this and how much uh, how much misery we inflict on the on the, the U.S. population. Uh, one point of uh, of direct relevance to all the VC-backed companies, and I think there are many of them on this webinar, is that for the last few days there's been a lot of confusion of whether or not the affiliation rule would essentially rule out VC-backed companies simply because. Uh, a portfolio company has to be aggregated with all the other portfolio companies of that VC and might trip the, the, the threshold of 500. Employee count. It appears as of the, the last uh, 24 hours that this, this obstacle has been overcome. And uh, the vast majority, perhaps uh, 80 or 90% of VC backed companies, ought to be able to, to get PPP relief uh, through the CARES Act. And I'm not sure how many banks are, are starting to take applications today. The final guidance uh, uh, from uh, the executive branch is probably not going to come out until Monday. But I suspect that uh, uh, early next week, uh, application will start flooding. Now, how, how quickly they get turnarounds and how quickly capital flows, uh, everybody's waiting with a bated breath. But I think this, this will make a big difference in how quickly we'll work ourselves out of this. Uh, you mentioned briefly uh, the work from home and the security concerns. Uh, you, you're absolutely right. So we, we pay a great deal of attention uh, to this because uh, as a VC firm, we do invest maybe a quarter of our portfolio of our capital into uh, cybersecurity companies. And we've seen a surge of, uh, of interest, uh, POCs, deployments in, uh, in companies who are helping to strengthen security at the edge. Essentially, the home is becoming the new enterprise edge because so many employees work from home. This is really what security has to start. So uh, this is these, this group of companies who participate in this broad uh, IENM, identity access management space within cyber, I think will benefit from Tailwind to clearly fall into this first bucket. Um, but for the majority of, of companies, and I, I can tell you that uh, uh, from our experience at BGV, and I think it's pretty typical of our, of our peers, the vast majority, maybe three quarters, fall into the second category where uh, companies have been shaken. The shark is definitely here. They have reduced spending. In some cases, they have uh, they've done, they've conducted targeted layoffs. They've clearly put a stop on uh, all face-to-face -face marketing activities resorted to a, a virtual events as opposed to physical events or conferences. In many cases, they have uh, reduced salaries, uh, anywhere from uh, 15 to 30 percent, and sometimes depending upon the uh, executive versus rank and file employees. And uh, I'd be very surprised if, if there are many companies who are just continuing as usual, unless they fall into this first bucket. Uh, so the vast majority are figuring out a way to basically extend uh, their cash runway to clearly get them to the other side of this. Now, the estimates of how long this takes uh, may vary. Uh, if we have some time towards the end, I'll share with you what, uh, what I've seen so far in terms of uh, where people think uh, we are, how deep the hole will be, and how wide, how wide it will be. Um, but for many companies who are in this, this situation where they have, to, they have to shrink their spending, they, in our view, they should not overlook the fact that uh, this may be an opportunity to combine with other companies to make uh, targeted acquisitions of assets that are much lower priced today than they were 60 days ago. And oftentimes for young companies, critical mass is what it takes to become cash repositive and to gain control of your destiny. So in our portfolio, we probably have three or four companies that have such opportunities that in the next 30 to 60 days could cleverly uh, purchase one or two other small pieces 
and together gain the critical mass they need uh, to finish the year on a, on, uh, in a cash flow positive state. This is something which, in our view, is too often overlooked. Uh, and it can, only, it can only take place if uh, going into this, you already had a pretty good sense of your strategy, what your roadmap was. And this way, you're prepared to take advantage of targeted acceleration. Unless you're uh, in the good fortune of uh, being in a, in a business like Anthony, where you can clearly accelerate your spending. Uh, if, if you have to decelerate your spending, it's very hard to press on the brake and the accelerator at the same time. But sometimes that's exactly what you've got to do. It's not just a blind press on the brake and stop. Uh, it's com sometimes it's a subtle combination such that when you come out to the other side, you're a different business. You've tweaked the pieces, you've tweaked the combinations, and you're much, much more prepared to become independent. Uh, maybe I should speak a little bit about um, the third category, which is uh, the most threatened category. And there, um, I I'm thinking about companies, uh, of course, I mentioned restaurants and uh, cruise lines, but uh, in my line of business in technology, it turns out we do have some restaurants. <laughs> These are robotics AI restaurants, and they had deployed their robotics kiosk in uh, university campuses. And guess what? There are no, no students in these campuses. They've closed down. They're not going to resume until August, assuming things uh, recover. Uh, so this is an example of a company which has had to, uh, to basically put everything on hold, hibernate, but to use the time for hibernation to think about cleverly how could they come out the other side a different company. And just to pick on this, this uh, company's example, the thoughts has been to make sure that robotics and AI robotics food solutions become relevant to a post-COVID future. Because viruses don't attack robots. And the supply chain that feeds a, a kiosk that's completely roboticized is pure and clean. So if people become fixated on not getting contaminated, even after we're on the other side of this crisis, then these food solutions become more relevant. And the time that's spent between now and the end of the summer can be used to ensure that uh, this company is completely repositioned for a post-COVID future. Another example of companies uh, who are severely threatened and face severe headwinds are companies who, uh, who had a single sales motion direct to enterprises. So when you have a sales force uh, that can produce revenues through intense face-to-face -face interactions with the customers, that's a very, very problematic situation. So these are companies who have to figure out a way to re-engineer the go-to-market approach, the business model, and enable channels to be able to uh, access these customers uh, in the same way, but far more cost-effectively. A direct sales force that's idle is the surest way to basically bleed your treasury down to zero or negative. And these are some of the companies who have to very, very quickly, nimbly on their feet, rethink the go-to-market approach and resorts to new marketing techniques and recruit channel partners such that they have a new business model coming the other side. Uh, <clears throat> so these are broadly speaking, the, the, the three categories that, that we've seen uh, and as I mentioned at, at, at the opening, as you can see, uh, no two companies are alike. Everyone has a, a particular way to optimize its own situation. So at, at this point, <laughs> we're getting uh, I, I, another I, 20, 25 minutes. Uh, we still have plenty of time for a question. Let me ask Anthony for his comments on the last part of the conversation. I, I was going to actually ask you two sort of pointed or specific questions, Eric, if you don't, if you don't mind, since sure. you guys have such a portfolio. Um, so I've gotten a number of calls from other sort of CEOs or CEOs um, in a similar size, you know, mid-range you know, size companies. 
Um, and their question has been, how much should we cut by? You know, what's, we're cutting salaries. How much should we cut by? When you said that um, there are, you know, companies in your, in your portfolio or maybe companies that you were giving guidance to that are doing cuts at the executive level and then separately, you know, um, below executive level. Is, is there guidance there? Like, w w w don't you think that'll cause a morale issue if the executive branch maybe doesn't take a cut and they're cutting, you know, 30, 40% across the board? Or is there a certain, you know, specific guidance you guys are giving to your companies? Well, um, we're giving the guidance that they need to cut roughly 20% of, uh, of their payroll expenses. Uh, this is for companies whose fundamental business yeah. uh, is not really threatened. They just have to extend the runway enough. So 20% okay. seems to be the right amount, but how they do this will vary. In some cases, uh, they don't really have weak players. They want to keep everybody on board. So a fairly broad cut, uh, everybody uh, takes a cut, makes full sense. Yep. But even within these situations, having the executives take more of a cut than rank and file employees is actually a way to, to keep the team totally committed. Uh -huh. uh, in other cases, um, where they would have no normally done a sort of cleanup of weak performers, then this is a chance to do to go even deeper and raise the bar. And rather than weeding out 5% lower performer, they may have to go to 10% or 12%. And that's something that's, uh, that uh, we've seen quite a bit. Uh, almost all of our companies uh, fall into one of the two cases uh, I described. Another thing that we've seen is that uh, oftentimes uh, cash bonuses have been, uh, have been eliminated or more, more precisely replaced by equity bonuses. <clears throat> this is an opportunity to preserve cash and it's also a way <clears throat> for people to, uh, to communicate the commitments you know, to the future of, of the company. If, okay. if they're willing to take equity, if they value this equity, uh, it's a very strong signal to not just the uh, insiders, but also the outsiders. Um, and then the second question that I thought of while you were speaking, and I think this is both maybe for Eric and Susie is, um, what guidance are you guys giving companies to apply for the CARES? Um, are you suggesting every company that's under 500 employees, you know, fill yeah. out the application and get and get the funds because it's going to be forgiven or, or no? No, I mean, I feel very strongly that this is um, money that will run out so that we really should be using this money for those companies that really are adversely impacted uh, by the coronavirus pandemic and, um, you know, I mean, obviously, being an accountant, I have some standards I have to uphold, but uh, I mean, I would consider- How about, how about the VCs? How about the sharks? <laughs> <laughs> what, are the, what are the sharks saying to do? <laughs> I'll, I'll skip this one. <laughs> uh, well, I do actually have a question for you guys, um, and I think- Oh, I think we lost Susie. Eric, you alluded to too long you think this will last. Um, sorry, you may have missed my connection. Did you guys get yeah, my we, question? Yeah, I think you were asking how, how do we think, how long do you think, do we think this will last? Yes, well, yes, uh, from your perspective. And how long will it take to recover? Yeah, um, maybe the, the best way to answer this is I, I came across uh, um, a very recent survey that was published today uh, about the sentiments that founders and VCs have about uh, uh, the, the depths and the lengths of this, this disruption. So let, let me share my screen and uh, other people will be able to, to see this. And I'll need to do this in a way that's not embarrassing by showing my entire computer. So maybe this one. <laughs> so I hope you can see this. Um, I think I picked this up from a survey run by NFX today. So you see that the VCs are in orange and the founders are in dark, uh, in, in black. And you see the percentage of, uh, of people that think uh, we're gonna get out of this in July, September, October, October April 21, April 21, 20, uh, April 22. So um, not surprisingly, founders are more optimistic than VCs. And I usually trust founders' instincts more than the VCs, but not in this case. 
I think founders have to have a more positive bias, otherwise they would not be founders. Um, I, I do think that uh, the disruption is, is going to last at least six months. Uh, so it's not until I think Q4 at the earliest that we're going to see some resumption of growth and it's not going to just snap back up just like we were in January. Uh, uh, we're, we're hopeful that uh, the vast majority of businesses will enjoy some measurable recovery in Q4, but no sooner. Uh, I, I don't see a, a sharp V-shaped recovery, but this gives you a sense of, uh, I think, the, the broad views shared by my peers and, uh, and the founders that, that they back. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think um, Q4 is the earliest that I think um, things will start to normalize. Um, and that's, again, if um, I think we have um, more, maybe, maybe let me think of a, of a nice word here, you know, consistent um, advice across the board. I think for hearing, you know, different states, you know, not ordering, you know, um, stay in home um, requirements and, you know, people still going to beach parties in Florida means that even if California is, you know, you know, turning off and, you know, Florida is not, when we're not restricting travel, this could resurge again and we might find ourselves in the same situation in two or three months um, where we're, we're now thinking and realizing maybe we should have, you know, done a better job. But, but yeah, I think, I think Q4 is a pretty good estimate, I think, the soonest. Good. Well, uh, it looks like many questions have, uh, have started to accumulate uh, you know, backlog here. So maybe we're going to we're going to turn to the the Q and A. Um, and uh, th this first one is about supply chain uh, supply chain problems, um, and maybe best addressed by, by you, Anthony, because you may have experienced this in the in the last couple of weeks. Yep. Uh, so uh, are businesses experiencing log jams in delivering and shipping to consumers, and how are they dealing with it? Um, I, we, we haven't seen anything, um, again, because we're, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we're one of the considered the essential businesses. Um, all of the, you know, most of our supply chain flows through Amazon. Um, so we haven't seen any issues sort of pop up there. We've seen some delays and by some, I mean a couple of days, you know, for the items to get to consumer, nothing, nothing like weeks or, or months, um, from the, the shipment to consumer side. Um, we've had our um, logistics partners on the trucking side um, reach out to us and say um, there are some delays again, but nothing that's disruptive um, that I can think of offhand. Um, everything is in the, the you know, scope of days, not weeks or months. So we've been able to adjust um, quite, quite well to, to those delays. So, I think uh, Amazon, sorry, go ahead, Susie. I was going well, to make Amazon might make, make the same point. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I may make a different point, but I think the thing is, is that as these essentials become more and more valuable, all of the ingredients that are in those essentials become valuable. So I think that you don't necessarily have log jams, but because of the price sensitivity, I mean, Anthony made a point that, you know, he has the luxury of being able to say, okay, with these people who are trying to gouge us, we're not going to work with them, you know pass this, but there's some people, smaller companies who don't have that luxury. And I think that is something that um, does impact the lead times artificially just because of greed. Yeah, yeah I, agree. So I, I was going to mention that uh, uh, supply chain delivery issues, logistics issues uh, have really put a stress on the Amazon system, which was part of the most uh, scalable system on the planet already. Uh, but still, they're, they're yeah, busily hiring uh, 100,000 workers um, and deploying them in the warehouses and uh, yeah. the logistics centers. They, they, they solved it, Eric, by not fulfilling <laughs> orders yeah. that, are, that are not essential. So, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I, I agree. Yeah, I mean, if you're, if, if you're definitely a non-essential um, or considered non-essential by, by Amazon, you can't even send an inventory to their warehouses. So they've completely cut you off. Um, they, so there has been a huge stress across the board um, on logistics, but I think that um, they've completely focused on health, grocery, um, I think it's beauty, um, home, wear and goods, and scientific and industrial, and, and baby, I think, are the categories they've said are deemed essential, and you send an inventory and, you know, maybe seen delays of a day or two, 
and then I also across the board, I think if it's already in inventory there, um, they are artificially pushing out the delivery date saying that you should accept, expect it, you know, um, let's say in seven days instead of two. But from what we've seen, at least in California, um, it's still arriving within the day or two window. They just, I think, are trying to avoid customer complaints coming in saying, you know, there's, there's an issue. Why don't I have my order? Um, yeah. Just trying to. Well, clearly there's a, there has been a few uh, glitches and a bit of sloppiness because uh, the system had not been tested for scalability to that extent. So yeah. you, have, uh, you have missed deliveries, you have uh, stolen deliveries, you have dates, uh, dates that appear on your screen that are missed by a day or two or, or three. So that, so that happens. But there, there's a question here that's, uh, that's related to this, but it really focuses on the, the warehouse workers. So all these companies like Amazon and, and other logistics companies are hiring warehouse workers uh, in a rush and delivery workers. Are they getting healthcare coverage? Uh, and are the, are the healthcare insurance providers covering these workers who go to work despite the shelter in place orders? Is this something that uh, you've um, you, you've heard about, uh, uh, Sudi? And this is a, if some of our, our webinar participants can actually be in this industry, and uh, they have to hire a lot of temporary personnel, uh, and how they're dealing with the healthcare coverage issues. So they do have a Families Act that came out earlier that actually is also extending some of those benefits, and um, I think people are concerned about that as well. I think in terms of what I've seen is that um, you see strikes going on, right? Because uh, there's a disconnect between what companies are willing to do and what um, employees uh, want. So I think at some point um, that um, will converge and it will change in terms of what I've seen exactly happen right now. It's I think people are still trying to figure out um, the PPP plan uh, about furloughing their employees and the like. I think they're at this point right now, um, it's early in the stage in terms of um, kind of getting to that. But I know that the need is getting bigger and bigger because uh, you, you hear about it all the time. So I, I know people have asked me about some clarity on those things as well as um, to their attorneys on that. And I think that will converge probably in the next few days. I don't know if it gives you an exact answer right now, but I think that's an answer to be seen. So we may have, we may have glossed over this before, but uh, obviously when companies have to reduce payroll expenses, they have a choice between furloughing and uh, laying off uh, employees. Uh, we at BGV have strongly encouraged uh, as CEOs to use furlough rather than uh, than layoffs. To start with, it's more humane. It uh, it preserves benefits and employee status for these employees. And secondly, it enables you to uh, restart when you get to the other side. And thirdly, it does not je jeopardize your PPP qualification. So that's in our view, this is a it's a better practice. Um, <clears throat> It's been a uh, question that uh, um, Eric, real, yeah. real quickly there, because I've, I've again, I've gotten a, a handful of calls about this from other um, CEO, CEO, CEOs. Um, if you furlough the employee, doesn't that still expose you as a company um, to the EFMLA um, uh, rules that have come out, where it's up to twelve weeks of paid um, vacation for for those employees? Susie, so maybe a vacation. I'm sorry, more, more complete time off. Yeah. 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 That is correct. And I think that's where the convergence comes in, right? Because I think uh, the old rules don't necessarily apply, right? With the, the new laws in terms of, um, you know, if somebody has uh, COVID-19 in their family or immediate family, you need to give them pay leave. Okay. Um, it's extended 12 weeks. There's also, I think for people, um, I had heard one company was saying, hey, um, we're going to furlough you, but if um, if you would prefer to get laid off, you can apply for unemployment and you'll get the amount of the unemployment plus another $600 from the government for every, um, every week. It's 2,400 additional for unemployment. So yeah. I think there's, um, there's, you know, I think, I do think that the government is doing everything they can to try to prop this up for, I guess, it sounds like um, the best estimate is Q4, right? That's what it looks like on the graph. 
I think, Susie, there are some, again, I haven't dug too deeply into it, but there are some um, protections company side as well, where um, if an employee is um, using the new guidelines from the uh, EFMLA that um, you get like a payroll tax um, credit as a company. Yeah. So, so it's, it's not a total sort of risk um, for companies under 500 employees. Right. And I think that's also what the payroll protection plan is to do is right. Yeah. Is to help. There's a, a level of forgiveness. If you use at least 75% of those funds for payroll costs that um, actually protects the company. I do think that, you know, as quickly as this bill has been kind of pushed out that there are, there are trying to consider all aspects of it. I do see one question about if you can apply for the economic uh, the IDL loan as well as the Paycheck Protection Loan? And the answer is yes, you can. The amount can't be co-fingled, co-mingled, and they can't be used uh, for the same purpose, but you can apply for both. Uh, there's some different rules on them. For example, the IDL may need uh, collateral as well as guarantee, or the Paycheck Protection uh, Program necessarily wouldn't, the interest rate on the payroll, uh, Paycheck Protection Loan is about 1% compared to 4%. Uh, on the EID alone. So there's different terms there, but you can't apply for both. There's a question about pricing. Um, so Anthony, you mentioned that uh, you've maintained your prices uh, throughout this period. Um, you've resisted the, uh, the urge to, to increase prices, even though you, you saw an increase in demands. What about the flip side? Uh, is it a time to consider lowering prices? Uh, um, so why why would that be why would be the case? Yeah, uh, I think um, if you if you can and maintain a happy margin, you should. Um, I, I I'm looking at the question as well. Um, I don't know if I agree with the the sentiment that if you lower your prices, you can't raise them um, once we sort of come out of this, uh, whenever that is. Um, we've always maintained a very very low margin on all of our items. Um, our our goal as a company has always been. The best item for the best price it's a super simple model <laughs> we're not we're not geniuses by any any regard but um i think if you if you can take a, a slight hit margin and still uh maintain um whatever you need to operate your company I, I don't think it's bad um in in any way shape or form um i think um outside of that you know maybe even altruistic um you know marketing campaigns are, are not a bad idea either we've at anthony's we um are giving away five thousand units uh shipped to elderly above 65 um, uh, individuals, you just have to like, you know, submit their a story about them to us and, and we ship them a unit for free. So um, I think there's a, a lot of ways you can um, maintain like a positive consumer sentiment towards your brand um, while just not being, you know, like um, a really bad player during this time. I, I, we've seen companies, including, you know, Amazon, <laughs> raising their prices upwards of 50, 60%, 100% on some items. I think um, an article came out where they uh, Amazon had raised their price um, 50% or 80% on hand sanitizer, like their own brand, the Solomo brand or, or something along those lines. So I don't think that's a great version of, of uh, maintaining brand equity, but, um, but I, don't, I don't think um, you know, minor price changes up or down um, really will um, affect how you can and should price after this is over. Um, we, we, we price change normally um, every, you know, every five to six days. So we constantly scour the landscape. Um, we see where we sit uh, against competitors and, and we're um, very competitive in that sense where um, I think that's a big part of succeeding in e-com. You're constantly changing your price um, to, to compete with, um, you know, other, other players in your space. And, and if you're not doing that, you're not pricing yourself or you're, you're not competing in, in the game correctly in e-com. Um, whereas sort of traditionally in brick and mortar, um, you know, you set a price for six months and you never look back, you know, so that's, that doesn't work online. Um, so you've got to sort of get that mindset of, you know, my price changes don't really matter on a day-to-day -day basis um, nor in, in normal sort of, um, you know, business circumstances. But, yeah. but I definitely wouldn't raise prices in this, in this, um, in this time unless you, you absolutely needed to, to maintain margin, um, not at yeah. a so, sort of, price gouging seems yeah, to be a price good idea. Yes. In some cases, lowering prices may be actually the smart thing to do for, for multiple reasons. First, uh, first, in some cases, it's a, it's a humane way of dealing with your, your consumers or, or your, your clients. Uh, secondly, it, it's, a, it's a brand building, uh, value affirming kind of behavior to have. 
in some cases, this is perhaps uh, the best way to hold on to the relationship. So for example, um, many landlords have uh, agreed to a, a break in rent, uh, at least for, for a while. When, uh, when you work from home and not using, not using your office, uh, at the very least, uh, you, could, you could request a, um, a postponement of the rents or at least a reduction in the rents. Uh, not every landlord is understanding of that, uh, but I think it's, uh, this is something that we've asked all of our CEOs to attempt to achieve uh, with the landlords. Um, another example of prices coming down would be um, banks like Silicon Valley Bank have agreed to a, a six-month moratorium on principal payments on, on the debts that they have issued. And obviously, Silicon Valley Bank has a very significant uh, market share amongst the early stage uh, venture back companies. And, uh, and, and if, uh, if they behave uh, in a privacy gouging way or uh, in an untreatable way, clearly they would lose, uh, their brand would be tarnished and they, they would lose market share. This, this is a great opportunity for them to, uh, to partner with uh, their clients and to, uh, uh, and to go through, to, to, to go through, through this period uh, with them and to reinforce uh, the relationship when, when they come out. So sometimes uh, calculated price reductions are the right thing to do. Yep, I agree. Makes sense. All right, we're almost uh, back to the top of the hour. Uh, and I think we've covered the, the key questions that were sent, uh, that were sent online. So, uh, <clears throat> I think it's time to wrap this up. Uh, I want to thank all of you uh, to participate in this webinar. Thank you for your questions. Uh, let me thank my panelists, uh, Susie and Anthony, uh, for the discussion. Uh, and remind you that uh, because this uh, Zoom session was recorded, uh, it'll be posted, it'll certainly be posted on the Singularly WAC site at singularlywag.com. It'll be posted on, uh, on the BGV site, benhamglobalventures.com as well in case you missed a, a portion of, uh, of uh, this session. Thank you all and stay safe and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.